Tonight I'm actually uh, going to read scriptures from, actually from two places. I'm going to read the very first of Acts because we are in the last chapter of the book of Acts tonight and I want to take you back to the beginning and, uh, and at the end of it and we want to, and I want you to kind of uh, reconcile all the things that we've been talking about as we go as we went through the book of Acts. The um, scripture I want to read is uh, the first two verses, the first chapter, and then the last verses of the uh, of Acts in twenty eight. The Bible says Acts one one and two. The former treatise. Have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Be it known therefore unto you, it says in Acts 28, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Now, begin with what I would like for you to recognize as we begin to look at this is that, you know, as we look, we went through the book of Acts and, and Acts is always named the Acts of the Apostles. And indeed, the events that we look at speak about things that God used the Apostles to do, the places He sent them to preach, the people that were saved, the number of events that occurred, the the beatings, the persecutions, the, uh, the martyrdoms, all of those things as a part of this. But the reality is that that first verse tells us really the direction it's going to begin with. You see, now the first treatise he was talking about, the very first thing he did was, was the Gospel of Luke. Luke was the beloved physician. Luke was the traveler. He traveled first with Peter as we looked at the very first part of the book of Acts, and then as God began to use Paul to go into the areas of the Gentiles and in all those directions, he went along with Paul, and at times he wasn't with him, and we can tell that in the scriptures, which ones he was and which ones he wasn't, because it'll say they did this, and then it'll say we did this. And so we recognize, or we went here, and. And those kinds of things show us that, that Luke was a, a part of the group that he was at actually as he was writing and, and talking about these different things. But in all of this, as he speaks about these things, he says these things are about what Christ is doing. These things are about what the Holy Spirit is doing. These are the events that take us in those directions. And... And so when we talk about the acts, we're talking about the acts of God. We're talking about how God moved in his people to accomplish his purpose, to bring about the, uh, the beginning of the church and the, and the growth of the church and all of those things. And as has been pointed out probably numerous times, uh, this is only the first chapter. When we look at the book of Acts, it is the early church, but God is still active in his church. He is still active with his people. He is still using them to lead souls to him. He is still touching lives today. The Holy Spirit is still active in the lives of those persons who have trusted Jesus as their Savior. And so someday uh, when we all gather together, we may see all of the story that we don't know all about right now. The things that took place following all of these events. Now there are a few things we know about and we may talk about a little bit of those as we go through this chapter and as we consider 
uh, some of the things that uh, that was taking place. Now, as we talked this morning, uh, we uh, we looked in uh, chapter 27 and we saw the delays that occurred. We saw as they were traveling and and uh, the circumstances in which they were, in which they tried to make a trip across that they should have stopped in a different place and wintered for uh, the three months that they would have to stop and winter. Uh, but they traveled on anyway in spite of what Paul told them. He said, I, 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 I believe we're going to suffer loss in this event, in this, in, in this uh, tr uh, trip that we're taking. But they paid attention to the owner of the merchandise that was on the ship. They paid attention to the people who uh, were the sailors on the ship, and they may have tried to make the trip. A big storm came up, and the next thing you know, what we're talking about, all those 14 days that that storm was upon them where they didn't see st stars, they didn't see the sun, all those things until they came to the place where they were close to that little island, and they, uh, they tried to running up into a little creek area and it grounded on the front and the, and the waves beat it and busted the ship up and and they ended up on the shore so we uh, that's where we left off this morning when we saw the shipwreck we're we're at the island of Melita it is uh, called Malta today I believe the same island that we're talking about and indeed the very area where the ship uh, went aground and, and the area where they ended up staying is, is often called something that has to do with St. Paul. Actually, the name of it today from what, I, uh, from what I can gather. But we saw on the map just a little bit about that and, we, uh, and it, it speaks about these people in a very interesting kind of way. It calls them barbarous. Now, uh, I want you to understand the, the idea that's behind this. It, it speaks about these people being very gracious, very kind uh, uh, in every kind of way to Paul and to his company, indeed even bringing uh, Paul in to stay with the chief person, which was the, uh, the, 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 the Roman ruler, I guess you'd say, on that particular island, because Rome had control of all of these areas, and and it's actually a title when it uh, when it calls him that, and uh, uh, and so I, I don't know maybe the centurion brought Paul into uh, contact with this individual or whatever the situation was in that way the one that was uh, in charge of Paul, uh, but uh, when we come to this uh, the, the thing you need to realize is in that day and time you know, if you were uh, civilized uh, you uh, you wrote you spoke you. Uh, you did whatever it was in the language of the day, which was the Greek language. And if people did not speak Greek, uh, they called them, uh, basically, uh, they, they talked about the manner in which they spoke being barbar or barbarous. And it was kind of a situation where, so it, had, it really doesn't mean they were uncivilized in the way that we think about uncivilized. They were, uh, they were very gracious and kind people. They were... Uh, and uh, and even as they left, following all of these things that we're talking about right now, they uh, they helped supply the ship. They helped supply them on their way, and and uh, and uh, those kinds of things. So uh, when we look at them, uh, you know, it's it's important that we understand uh, just a little bit about the way of thinking about what uh, was going on in that particular day and time. Uh, they. Uh, we would think about barbarians or whatever as being somebody way back hidden in a jungle somewhere uh, running around about half naked or whatever like that. And that's not what the situation is. That's not what's going on on this particular island. Now, I've, uh, I've put the map up there to show you uh, where uh, the island is. And uh, w uh, we had that as the last... Uh, uh, scene that we saw this morning as we were finishing up the message and and uh, looking at uh, what was going on in in that situation. Now, interestingly enough, as they got uh, on the land, uh, probably kind of wet, uh, they had had to, they got off the boat. Some of them on boards and some of them swimming and getting to the place and and. Uh, 276 people, all of them alive. That's what we uh, recognize from this morning. That's what the Bible says, that they all uh, came through it. 
And uh, uh, so, obviously, wet and cold and tired, uh, they picked up wood and they uh, brought it over and they got it ready to make a fire and that kind of thing. And and uh, so Paul uh, was helping pick up wood. He was going around doing, uh, being a servant. He was doing his job. He was doing what needed to be done. And and as they were putting the wood in the fire, uh, a, uh, a snake came out, latched onto his hand, he shook it off. Now, you know, this is an interesting story, an interesting event that occurred because, uh, well, for one thing, uh, you know, I, I think probably all of us have heard stories. I, I think I may have told you all about an event that my mother told me about when she was a little girl when they were they brought in uh, uh, wood, and it actually had a frozen snake in it. And uh, they, they, they would, anybody would normally, you know, I mean, they don't, they're not afraid of a frozen snake. I mean, you pick the thing up, and you do whatever you want to with it. But when it begins to thaw out, sometimes you realize it's not a dead snake, it's just a little bit cold, okay? Uh, well, that's kind of the situation that was here. Only this particular snake was a very poisonous snake, and as a result of it, when when it came out and lashed on the Paul, the, the, the thought of the people was, well, goodness, he escaped from this ship that wrecked. and he, I mean, he should have died in that, but he's a bad man, and as a result of that, he's probably uh, getting what he, what's coming to him anyway. They was looking for him to swell up at least or fall down dead, you know, but he just shook it off and went on. And then suddenly their whole mind changed, and they said, well, he must be a god then. So they saw. So they kind of got an opinion on it in one direction or the other. Well, you know, opinions of people don't matter. Paul was a man of God, certainly. Paul was a minister of God. Paul was a uh, an evangelist and a preacher and a pastor. And he was he and all of the things that he had been doing in the churches. All of those things came through. He was an apostle of God. He was a messenger, uh, but he was a man and. Uh, you know, the reality is he wasn't, uh, he wasn't, uh, uh, well, he was a forgiven sinner, just like we are. And the reality is then that, uh, that he's, he wasn't a God. He wasn't any of those things. He was, he was a man that loved God and loved his people and loved the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the reality is that uh, this was done uh, as it spoke about in the book of Mark. At the very close of the book, if you'll remember, it says, the, Jesus told his apostles as they were standing there, he says, these signs shall follow believers. Now, let me explain that just a little bit. In the course of history, as we have looked from the time of Christ till now, any time that Christian witness has went to a place where there has never been witness, where there is a need to know, where they haven't heard about Christ before, where these things, then oftentimes miraculous things take place that show them that this is indeed God doing this. Now, I'm not questioning that God does miracles all the time, because He does. There isn't any question that He heals, that He touches, that He moves in lives in miraculous ways that just becoming a Christian is a miraculous event. The reality is that that's true. But as we look at these particular things, understand that God uses the means that are necessary to touch the lives of people where they are and in their circumstance. And these people knew nothing about the true God. Now they were religious people. They were superstitious people. They were people who saw things and believed in gods of so, probably all kinds of gods. But they didn't know about Jesus. They didn't know about the one true God. They didn't know about what Jesus had done for them or the price that he had paid. They didn't know about the crucifixion. They didn't know that he had died to give them life. They didn't, they didn't know those things. And so the opportunity came as a result of this for Paul to be able to present that gospel message, for things to occur in such a way that these people could learn what we're talking about. Now, it doesn't mean that the gospel hadn't went a lot of different places that we're looking at, and we see as we go on into this chapter that when Paul gets close to Rome, there's already Christians there. They come out to meet him, you know. But 
The reality is that this place needed to know about Jesus. And this was the opportunity that came for them to know. As we, as we read what it is uh, that it says here. It says, And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. This is verse 6 and 28. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island. That's what we're talking about. His name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of the fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. And when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laid us, uh, they laded us with such things as were necessary. Now, uh, see what it's, what it's saying. The opportunity was to touch a lot of lives in that circumstance because of the things uh, that took place and happened there. Now, out of those signs that Jesus said would follow believers, two of them happened right here. Uh, now, you, you, all, you all have all heard that, that song that, from years ago that, you know, about, uh, uh, about the taking up the serpent in one thing or another, you know, and, uh, but he didn't and I ain't and all that kind of thing where, they stuck, where he sung that song about, um, let's see, what was the name of that song? Uh, 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 but anyway, talking about handling snakes. Well, you know, this is the manner in which he was talking about where something happens that you're unexpected or situation in that kind of way. Now, let me, let me just say that I know uh, about an event years ago when my mother was very young and she told me about him. And I knew the man uh, where somebody came in trying to break up a service and threw down a bunch of rattlesnakes and he went over and picked them all up, put them in a box and carried them out without getting hurt. Now, you know, I... Uh, I'm not going to say anything bad about that, okay? But what I am going to say is that the Bible says, tempt not the Lord thy God, okay? And uh, so we're not to go around picking up poisonous snakes. And we certainly, and, and even the people who pick up poisonous snakes don't go around picking up a glass of poison and drinking it, okay? And it speaks about that as well. What it's talking about is an event like what we're talking about here in the Bible. It's talking about what happened with Paul. It's talking about that snake coming out of the fire and biting him and the circumstances that surrounded that. And, uh, you know, uh, snakes have bitten Christian people and Christian people have died and, it has, and things have happened in that kind of way. But this is the kind of circumstance where the gospel message is furthered by what happened. And that's, and that's what we're seeing uh, take place here. Now, speaks to him about uh, some other things here as we look. Uh, uh, the, uh, there, as it get on down here just a little ways, it says, then, and after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria. Now, uh, they had wintered in the isle. Now, we talked about that this morning. They needed to st stop going for three months because of the weather situation. It was dangerous. And uh, so they ended up having to do that one way or the other. And this is where they were at. And so three months they departed in a ship of Alexandria which had wintered in the isle whose sign was Castor and Parlox. Now, Castor and Parlox were um, uh, considered by the Romans to be two sons of uh, the god Zeus, okay? And basically what it amounts to is it was the way the ship was made with, um, with basically a, a carving of those two particular uh, false gods. And so it was kind of a ship that was dedicated to a false god, and yet that's, uh, that was the travel, that was the way they went, and uh, that was the circumstance. Uh, uh, Paul didn't, couldn't decide, well, I'm not going to ride on this ship because he was put on as a prisoner. And so it says then... And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there for three days. Now, looking at the map again, uh, on Jerome, uh, you can see 
where the island is down there. I've moved the circle up to show you where Syracuse is. It's right on the corner of that uh, island of, of uh, Sicily. It was a very uh, significant city in that day and time. It was uh, uh, an important uh, port. Um, I, um, uh, I read uh, what the name of it is today. I believe it, it uh, may have been uh, Naples or something like that. Uh, that uh, in that area may not be the exact location, but it's, it's close to it, I believe. Um, but I, I don't remember uh, for absolutely certainty if that's uh, if um, if that's what uh, what it was. Uh, but anyway, it's about 80 miles north, uh, uh, put in into that particular uh, that particular port, uh, and uh, so then um, uh, uh, going on. Uh, uh, they uh, left out of there and went about, uh, I don't know, uh, 60 miles maybe, uh, somewhere along in there, on up the coast, and, uh, uh, and they came to, uh, after three days, they went to Re uh, Regium, and, uh, and after one day, the south wind blew, and we came the next day to uh, Puteola, uh, or something to that, uh, to that effect, so uh, uh, let me just take you back there. They were there for seven days um, because they found Christians there, and uh, so the, uh, they were they had a place to, to stay and people to uh, to fellowship with. And evidently, the centurion who was in charge of Paul uh, was very lenient with him in a lot of different ways, and uh, so that's. Uh, that's quite a little ways on up there, uh, where you go from there across that strait uh, up to uh, where that particular city is. And um, uh, it says, And so we went toward Rome, and from thence when the brethren heard of us, now these are the brethren that are in Rome that it's talking about, they came to meet us as far as Apif uh, the uh, Apiforum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. Now, let's kind of look at it just for a second here. Uh, and you can see just above where they were at. Now, now from what I understand, um, the three, uh, where it uh, speaks about there, uh, the Appian Way, that's the way that we're talking about going toward Rome. Uh, the Three Taverns is about 30 miles out of Rome, and the Apiforum Ap is uh, about 40 miles. So part of them came down all the way the 40 miles, part of, and then another group came uh, about 30 miles or so. And they met him, and they uh, probably traveled with him then uh, back, to, uh, back to Rome. So it says, When we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. So in looking at that, uh, the one thing that we see from that is that, uh, that Paul, now he's at Rome. You see where Rome's at up, up there. Um, the difference in the prisoners we talked about this morning, and I don't know that I necessarily need to go through that again, but the fact is Paul was a Roman. He was being guarded by a centurion. He was, uh, he was treated specially because he had appealed to Caesar. He had that right to do that as a Roman citizen. And other prisoners were, uh, uh, were different than that. They had committed crimes, and probably many of them were facing the Colosseum or, or death or a number of things that was probably uh, to occur in that direction uh, for that. So. Uh, he, um, because of his Roman citizenship, because of the manner in which he was coming to Rome and the purpose for which he was coming to Rome, and all of those things uh, made for a difference in the way he was treated. Uh, as he traveled, as he stopped at different locations, as he, and when he arrived at Rome, how he was treated while he was there to begin with. Now, so uh, we see... Uh, what was allowed, and we're going to uh, look at that just a little bit, came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together 
And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or custom of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who when they had examined me would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to excuse had ought to accuse my nation of, for this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Now, what Paul says uh, to them was, I didn't really have a choice, because they were going to, basically, they were, gonna, uh, they, they were laying in wait to kill him. And so when uh, Festus says, are you willing to go down there and face the charges at Jerusalem? He said, he said, you don't have any right to turn me over to them because I haven't done anything to them. I appeal to Rome, uh, to Caesar. And so he said, well, uh, you appeal to Caesar, to Caesar you're going to go. And, that's, and that was the, uh, the terms that took place. And while they came up and accused him and while he sat in front of Agrippa and Festus both and preached a message that was a tremendous message talking about what God had done in his life and how those things had occurred and how, how Jesus had saved him and everything that had to do with that speaking about the prophets and the message of the prophets and uh, he still uh, he, he, uh, the trip to Rome was inevitable uh, they had, God had already told him that he was going to have to stand before Caesar so these were the things that were uh, that, that we've seen coming for uh, a number of chapters now as we've looked through the events we've seen uh, quite a time uh, as we went through there he was, in, he was at the palace in Caesarea for at least two years that we know of as a result of the fact that Felix uh, wanted to get a bribe out of him or something to that effect and so we've seen all of those things uh, as, as uh, they've come through here uh, but he says uh, to them, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. He said, I'm not here to try to down Israel. I'm not here to try to put down anything about that. I'm just saying I was innocent. I didn't do anything deserving of death. And he says, for the hope of Israel am I bound in this change. Now, what is the hope of Israel? The hope of Israel has always been the same hope that the Messiah would come. It was the hope of Israel. The Messiah had come. Jesus was the Messiah, and they had rejected him, and they had turned him aside, and they had, they had not accepted him or who, of who he was in any kind of way. They saw one Messiah, but God had spoken of another. They saw only the Messiah that will be King of kings and Lord of lords. They did not see the suffering Savior. But the suffering Savior has been spoken about all the way through Scripture from the very beginning, through the books of Moses and through all the prophets. We read Scriptures that speak to us about Jesus, that tell us about what He was going to come to do and what He did do. And all of those things were fulfilled in Him. And we recognize that reality. And so Paul, as he's talking to these Jewish leaders in Rome, he is speaking to them about what the prophets have said, what Moses has said, teaching, speaking, and hoping to touch some of them with the reality of the gospel message. And so he says, And when they said unto him, We neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, they can't, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning to evening, all day long, he talked to them about who Jesus is from the Old Testament Scriptures, teaching them and showing them what God had said about Jesus. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. That's the situation. And when they departed, when they agreed not among themselves, they departed 
After that, Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and saying, Here you shall hear, and shall not understand, seeing you shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Well, you know, when I watch a movie sometimes, and suddenly I realize that the end ain't going to be what I want, I just turn the movie off. You all ever do anything like that? Well, if I'm reading a book and I don't like the direction it's heading, I put it down and go read something else. They didn't like the direction that the gospel message was going. They refused to listen. They refused to hear. They refused to let it penetrate their heart. They were against it to start with, and it didn't matter what Paul said, they were going to be against it. Some of them were just not going to trust or believe what Paul had to say. They were already biased against it from what people said about this sect, is what they called it. And as a result of it, the same thing that Paul did everywhere he went, he said to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. He tried to go to the synagogues. He tried to touch the Jewish people wherever they were. He tried to begin with them who had a knowledge already of prophets, of law, of the message that God had given to his people. They already had a little knowledge. He wanted to help them along. But when they refused, there were always some that believed but when they refused to believe, then he went to the Gentiles. And that's what he says here at the very end of this. He says, you won't listen, you won't hear. So be it known therefore to you, he says in verse 28, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and they will hear it. And thankfully, the message did go forth. It speaks about Paul and one more uh, little thing as it tells about him. It says that he went to uh, uh, says that he preached and nobody forbid him. And he lived in his own hired house. That means he paid the money for being able to stay there. Now, was he totally free? Totally free to receive anybody who wanted to come and see him totally free to teach and to preach right there in his house, but he was under house arrest, okay? But we don't know the rest of the story. That's the end of what we see here. Unhindered, the gospel going forth. Uh, different things have been spoken about and different accounts have been given, and there are those that say that after those two years that Paul was at that he went before uh, the emperor and that he was actually set free and then preached in Spain and maybe even as far as Britain. But we don't know those things. We just don't know. Uh, it may have been very close to the end of his life right here. We don't know. We, we do know uh, a little something about it. It has been expressed uh, that Paul eventually was beheaded in Rome uh, for the cause of the gospel and uh, that uh, uh, so he was martyred there he wasn't put on a cross he was a Roman citizen Roman citizens were not crucified uh, they chopped their heads off if they found reason to, uh, to put them to death or done some other way um, but um, eventually uh, Paul gave his life for the cause of the gospel as did many all, well all of them except John as far as we know of the apostles uh, were martyred for the cause of Christ. And John certainly went through a great deal with his eyes put out and they, and they say he was boiled in oil one thing or another, but uh, he's the only one we know of that may possibly have died a natural death. But, uh, but the cause of Christ went forward and the gospel message went out. And uh, the reality is that uh, uh, the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ has made all the difference in the world that we live in. 
Now the truth is that as we look at those particular places and things, we, you know, it spoke about them, those people in that, on that island being barbarians in dark times and one thing or another. But I'm afraid that the darkest time is ahead of us. That as people reject the light, they turn to the darkness. As they reject the truth, they turn to falsehood. falsehood. As they as we reject the reality of who Jesus is and who God speaks to us about, then they accept something that's more in line with the way they want to think and the way they want to live. And they do what Isaiah said. When they shut their eyes to the truth, then they accept what's not true. And our society is going further away from God and not toward it. But it doesn't have to be that way if people will trust and believe and follow Jesus. And we as Christians continue the mission that was started by the apostles. We have the gospel message. We have the truth. We have not what the world needs more than anything else. And wherever you are, if you're listening to me, on a video, or you're here in this place. The reality is that there is one hope for any of us, and that hope is Jesus. Because there is one way to God, and one way only. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It plainly says to us, there is but one way, and that way is Jesus. So you either trust Jesus and live or you reject him and face the judgment. Because the Bible tells us that those that believe not are condemned already because they have not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So trust him and live. Take the opportunity and know him and let him be your Savior. Because that's the one way and the one hope that you have, that I have, that anyone has, wherever they are. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we're so very thankful for the message of the book of Acts, for the way that you showed us as the church grew and as it prospered and as it became. And Lord, as it faced challenges both inside and out, Lord, we have those words that we find here. And you never pull any punches. You always tell us the truth. You tell us what's right and what's wrong and uh, what should be done. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us as your people to ever be mindful of your will and your way. And Lord, to preach the message that you have given us, not our ideas, but what you said. Lord, present the gospel message of Jesus. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that needs Jesus as Savior, that you will touch that heart, convict and convince and draw them to yourself, that they may know the truth, and that they may believe, and that they might have life. In Jesus' name, amen.